guys recognize those twits? You're old. You're old. Will Ferrell, Chris Catan, Roxbury guys from Saturday Night Live. Two flat out misfits, you know, bobbing their heads, trying to be cool in search of love, right? Sometimes when they did their sketch on Saturday Night Live, the co host for the night, someone like Alec Baldwin or Tom Hanks or Jim Carrey or Sylvester Stallone, they'd kind of do it with them. And they'd always be playing that stupid song. What is love? What is love? It's a weird song, isn't it? The music's kind of upbeat, but the words are dark. Upbeat music, dark words. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. I'm giving you my love, but you don't care. What's love? And it's kind of a farcical twist on one of the biggest questions of all time. What is love, really? Do you know that almost two-thirds of our songs are some kind of a love song? We're obsessed by it, and we're just not very good at it. You know why? Because God created us to love and be loved. But we don't want to do it His way. So we're not very good at it. Now, we're starting part two of this apologetic series that we've been in since January. Why do we believe in God? Why does theism make way more sense than atheism, not believing in God? I know that I cannot prove to you that there is a God, and you cannot prove to me that there is not. But the evidence for God revealed to us, the kind of God revealed to us in and through Jesus, is powerful. It's way stronger than the evidence against Him. It's going to take a leap of faith either way, but I think it takes way too much faith to be an atheist. Now, we've looked at some of the big ones, guys. We've I mean, what makes more sense? That this universe that we're in simply created itself, it's finite, that it created itself out of nothing? Kind of like magic on steroids. Or is there an eternal, transcendent, omnipotent God, a God who stands outside of this whole thing, who got it started? What makes more sense? And the evidence from design, it's stunning. It's stunning. I mean, the, the odds of something so infinitesimally small and almost an infinitely dense particle, the way that it's believed to have taken place, evolving into the universe that we live in without a designer. And the odds that you can get from a pile of dirt to an eyeball without a designer God, well, you either believe in God or you believe in magic. And we talked about evil. I mean, there's some people who say, how can there be a good God, right, if there's so much evil in the world? Well, if you're going to ask that question, why are you in the world, right? Well, maybe bigger, how can you call anything evil at all if there is no God? And we talked about God and the value of life and God and the meaning of life. Without God, guys, you don't matter. Life doesn't matter. Now, if you missed any of this stuff and you want to go catch up, you can find it on our website or on our YouTube channel. We've been basically making this case, guys, doing life with God, for God, God's way, makes way more sense logically and experientially than any alternative. But we're going to kind of turn to a slightly different direction for a few weeks. So we're going to look at what I'm going to call the fingerprints of God. They're all around us, the fingerprints of God. They're not really proofs of God. It's just that the world that you live in and your experience of life makes, makes way more sense if you acknowledge that there is a God. Things like love and beauty and sex, and death and dying. Those things are way different for those who understand that there is a creator God and that you were created in the image of God. See, guys, we're not just animals. We're the hybrids. We are the ones who are kind of like animals, but we also have the spirit created in the image of God. Now, if you're an atheist and you're smart, you're probably going to push back. Because, to an atheist, we are just animals. A couple weeks ago, a rat is a pig is a dog is a boy, right? Maybe a little bit more advanced evolutionarily, but still just animals, right? And if you're an atheist and you're smart, you're probably going to conclude that it is not really love, it's just biology. It's just chemicals. It's not really love. It's a chemical reaction as your body releases these hormones 
that make you feel all fluttery. No different from what a rat or a pig or a dog might experience. In fact, here are, is kind of what the smartest atheists say about love. John Paul Sartre said love is absurd. Is that your experience? B.F. Skinner called love an illusion. What do you think? Daniel Wegner, psychologist at Harvard, said that you don't choose love, really. We don't choose love because all of our actions and all of our feelings are simply the effects of unconscious physical causes. You're a machine, and you're programmed to feel and to act the way you feel and act. Francis Crick, the atheist who kind of sorted out DNA, he says, all of the joys of life, things like love, are no more than the behaviors of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You are nothing more than a molecule machine. And the love that you think that you are feeling is simply a biological reaction. It's not love, it's just chemistry, right? Just biology, right? Aldous Huxley, one of the smartest and most famous of the atheists, put it like this. He says, of all of the worn, smudged, dog-eared words in our vocabulary, love is surely the grubbiest and the smelliest and the slimiest. Bald from a million pulpits, lasciviously crooned through hundreds of loud speakers, it has become an outrage to good taste and decent feeling, an obscenity which one hesitates to pronounce. Well, I hope not. I don't think that's what God meant for love to be. And some of the smarter psychologists are going to tell you that love that you think you feel it's just a product of natural selection. Somewhere in our past, the critters that took care of each other, that served each other, survived better than those who were just in it for themselves. So love is just an evolutionary strategy, right? I'll take care of you if you take care of me. That works. Listen, guys. If you're an atheist and you believe that love is anything more than a chemical reaction in the machine that is your body, then you're living out a massive contradiction. If you actually think that you are free to love or not, guys, that actually flows out right out of the truth that God is real Amen. and that you were created to be different than the rest of the animals because there is a kind of love that flows to you and through you that's only there because you were created in the image of God which means you have the capacity to choose a God kind of love, a different kind of love. Here it is, guys. Love is from God, even the kinds of love that animals are capable of. But God also gave you the ability to love a different kind of love that goes way beyond what the animals are capable of. I'm going to show you. Now, if you were to Google the science behind love or the chemistry of love, you're going to find this article published by the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Love Actually, the Science Behind Love, Attraction, and Companionship. It's a great article. It's fun. It's fascinating. Here's, here's the first line. In 1993, Hathaway, they asked the world, what is love? That's that song from Saturday Night Live. They say, I'm not sure he ever got his answer, but you can have yours now. Bottom line, the article says, what you feel is just chemistry. It's all it is is chemistry. You ever fallen in love and, you know, you, maybe you get tongue-tied or you say something stupid or you feel all sweaty or feel your heart pounding or whatever? Do you know that actually what's taking place is that your brain is telling your body to release these chemicals that are causing your body to go haywire? Just chemicals. Same chemicals that you might find in a rat or a pig or a dog. They tell us that love can be distilled actually into three different kinds. You've got lust, attraction, and attachment. And they tell us that each different kind of love is driven by a different set of chemicals. These chemicals kind of control, they drive the way that you feel. So testosterone and estrogen, they drive lust. Dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, they drive attraction. 
oxytocin vasopressin drive attachment. Isn't that cool? It's chemistry, right? Just biology. Just like other animals, our brains tell our bodies to pump out testosterone and estrogen, and our desire for sex starts ramping up. All of the animals have it, this drive to reproduce, this drive to pass on their genes to perpetuate the species. It's lust. Attraction is different. You don't have to be attracted to someone to feel lust. Sometimes it's just sex for animals, right? Dogs aren't picky. Cows aren't picky. The bull's going to go after every cow in the field. Attraction's different. The chemicals are different. Your brain starts telling your body to pump out dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin, and it starts feeling good when you spend time with that special person. It feels good. In fact, it might feel so good that you might actually have a hard time eating and sleeping. It feels good. A lot of that's chemistry. Animals can feel some of that kind of stuff, too. Did you know that? And then there's attachment, the kind of love that goes beyond romance, the love of a parent for a child, the bond between two close friends, different kind of love, different chemicals. Your body is now pumping out oxytocin and vasopressin, the feelings of connection and bonding. And, I don't know if you realize this, but it looks like oxytocin and vasopressin, those attachment hormones, they kind of block the pathways for some of the other hormones, which may kind of explain why the passion of romance cools as attachment grows. You ever felt that? People think they're falling out of love as it morphs into a different kind of love. But some people like the feelings of passion more than the feelings of attachment, so they divorce and they move on. It's chemistry, right? Because we're just animals, right? No. Because unlike all of the rest of the animals in this world, all of those animals that were created by God, He created us to be different. We are the ones who are also created to be in the image of God. We are the ones that He created to be free, free to choose. We have the capacity to choose a deeper kind of love, a God kind of love. In fact, we are the ones who will never be entirely satisfied by the lesser forms of love. We not only have the capacity, but we have this hunger, this craving, this yearning for a deeper kind of love. Let me show you. Now, if you've been around Capital City for a while, you guys realize that C.S. Lewis is one of my heroes, right? An amazing Christian thinker, teacher, writer, wrote this little book called The Four Loves. The Four Loves. Really good. See, back in the world of the Bible, they didn't call it all love. They actually had four different words for four different kinds of love. They had the word eros. Eros, sexual love, sensual love, erotic love, lust kind of love. They even had a god that they called eros, the god of erotic love, one of their favorites, I suspect. A whole lot of eros in the world of the New Testament, but the guys in the New Testament really didn't talk a whole lot about it, not because they didn't feel it, because we all do. God created it. It's good in its proper place. But the guys who wrote the New Testament were trying to get us to focus on a deeper kind of love. Maybe the most common world, word in that world for love is the word philos. Sorry about that. Philos, friendship love. The kind of love that you have for a good friend. Maybe the kind of love that you have for another Kentucky Wildcat fan, right? Someone else who loves to golf, fish, hunt. The kind of love that you might have for someone who's a kindred spirit, politically. The kind of love that you might have for someone who shares your faith in God. There's a bond. You're connected. Philos love, friendship love is incredibly important. God put that in you. Because God didn't make you to go it alone. And then there's storge, kind of love a mom or a dad might have for a kid. And it's different. I don't know how many of you guys are watching this series, 1883. 
you're not, I'd recommend it. It's really good. Tim McGraw, Faith Hill, Sam Elliott. It's a Western, and a lot of people in it die. But when Elsa dies in the last episode in the arms of her dad, it tore my heart out. It was hard for me to keep my eyes on the screen because you've got a dad holding the most precious thing in his world as she dies. Storge, the love of a mama, the love of a dad, even when the love is towards someone who's messed up, broken, or dying. And it's a kind of love that was planted in you by God. But none of those three kinds of love, guys, are unique to us humans. See, I think you can see arrows driving just about every animal out there, just biology. Their bodies start to pump out testosterone and estrogen, and the brain pretty much shut down as the passion takes over. And I also think you can see some animals exhibiting kind of a philos kind of love. Animals can bond. They'll cluster into packs and herds and colonies, kind of like we do, except for cats. Cats are entirely self-absorbed. I think animals even exhibit some of that storge kind of love. Cows are usually pretty docile, but try to get between a cow and its calf. See what happens to you. You're liable to get mauled. Some of them protect their young just like we do. Eros, philos, storge, different kinds of animals, all gifts from our creator God. He made us so that we could experience those things. They're gifts that we share in some ways with other animals in this world. But we're different. We're different. We were the ones created in the image of God, which means we have a capacity for another kind of love, a God kind of love, an agape love. Not the kind of love forced on us by our hormones, like animals. It's the kind of love we choose or not. When we feel like it or not. And it's the kind of love that blows our minds. Listen, guys, why does God love you? Because these hormones are coursing through his body? Of course not. Why does God love me? Because he finds me so adorable, <laughs> so lovable. Come on. God doesn't love me because I'm so lovable. He doesn't love you guys because you're so adorable or so good. God chooses to love you anyway. Do you understand that? Not because you're so good, but because he is so good. Which is why he loves us when we don't honor him, as well as when we do. God's kind of love is not a response kind of love. God doesn't look for something attractive in me and respond to that. God brings out love. He's the source of love. He chooses to love me because that's the kind of God he is. And he gives you the capacity to love that same kind of love. And I can choose to love you when you're not lovable at all. You can choose to love me when I'm not attractive at all. I hope you do. How cool is that? You know why? Because we're not animals. We share the image of God. You believe that? Yes. You see, guys, we get scared because we fear we don't love God enough, right? And we fear that if we don't love God enough, he's going to stop loving us. Just poppycock. Our problem is that we can't fathom how much that God loves us anyway with an entirely different kind of love, this agape love. We think God is fickle like we are. We think God changes his mind about us every time we screw up, like we tend to do with people. We think God is up there tallying our sins so that someday he can crush us. So sometimes we're more worried about the consequences of our sin than we are about the sin itself. But as we mature, I hope, we begin to understand that God is never going to stop loving us because his love is different this agape love. And here's the deal. He's given you the ability to do exactly the same. It's the kind of love that blows our minds. It's the kind of love that melts hearts. It's a Mother Teresa kind of love. 
pours yourself out for those who are despised and can't give back. It's the kind of love that it's going to blow your mind when you hear about a Christian mom who forgives the drunk who killed her son or a Christian dad who forgives the guy who raped his daughter. It makes no sense. It's the kind of love that is necessary when a spouse gets Alzheimer's. It's the kind of love that keeps marriage strong when the feelings fade for a time. Because agape love doesn't quit. It's a kind of love that a Christian can show to someone who's canceling him, persecuting him, bullying him. The kind of love that the Apostle Paul showed to a jailer who had just beaten him when he leads that jailer to Christ and baptizes him. It's the kind of love that any one of you can choose because you are not an animal only. You were created in the image of God. Now, if you want to dig deeper into this agape kind of love, I recommend going to 1 John. Spends a lot of time there, especially in chapter 4. In verse 7, John says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. I mean, even the first two words, dear friends, in the Greek is agape toy. You guys who are loved by God with that special kind of love, you're agape by God. And since you're agape by God, let's make sure that we agape one another because agape comes from God and everyone who agapes has been born of God and knows God. I know, guys, Eros comes from God too. He likes it. Philos comes from God, too. He loves that. Storge, love, comes from God. But this agape is a different kind of love. It's a God kind of love. John says, verse 8, whoever does not love doesn't know God. Because that's who he is. Whoever doesn't agape, doesn't know, doesn't honor, doesn't obey God, because it's who he is, and it's how he made us in his image. And that kind of love is not just chemistry. It's not just biology. In fact, it violates nature, violates human nature at its worst, which is why it blows our minds. John says, this is how God shows us that his his love among us. This is what agape looks like. This is what agape love does. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That's his picture. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loves us anyway and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not because we're so lovable, not because we deserve anything at all from God, just because he chooses to love us anyway. A choice kind of love, a love of the will, not of the heart. And it is the most powerful kind of love. And then the Apostle John says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, We ought to love one another because we can, because we're different, because we're not just animals. And because we're not just animals, we don't just have to follow our heart because this kind of love is not driven by our feelings. It's driven by our will. And God expects those who share his image to try this kind of love. So John says there's no fear. There's no fear in this kind of love. Because agape love casts out fear. I wish you could get that, guys. I wish I could get you to believe that, not just up here in your head, but right down here in your hearts. It's so hard to understand. It is so hard to believe, so difficult for us to believe that that's how God loves us. Because of that, it's so difficult for us to show that kind of love to people around us. This is image of God kind of love. And here's where we can. Verse 19, we love, we can love, we can agape. You know why? Because he showed us how. He first loved us. He gave us the capacity, the ability for this kind of love, and then he showed us how in Jesus. So, do you believe it? Do you believe God loves you that? First of all, do you believe there's a God? And how in the world can you understand love if there's no God, guys? Makes no sense. But do you believe that a God could be this good? That an almighty creator God 
can actually love the creatures that he created even as messy as we get. If you don't believe that about God, you're not looking at the real God. You've shrunk your imaginary God into your image. And do you believe that you can do it too? That when he created you in his image, that he gave you the capacity to kind of love like he does. And if you don't believe that, you don't get it. We are not just animals, guys. We were created in the image of God, and we are called to love each other with a deeper kind of love, a love that will not disappoint, a love that will not break. There's a journalist and author. They call him Ann Wilson. At first, some people thought he might be the next C.S. Lewis until he renounced his faith in God. He says, after a... I realized that after a lifetime of church going, the whole house of cards had collapsed. That sense of God's presence in my life, the notion that there was any kind of God, let alone a merciful God in this brutal, nasty world. And as for Jesus, having been the founder of Christianity, the idea seemed perfectly preposterous. It was nonsense. Together with any idea of a personal God, a loving God in this suffering universe, nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Atheists like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, they were ecstatic that he had joined their side. And Wilson started writing books about the delusions of us Jesus followers. He's a hero to the other side. <laughs> and then the oddest thing happened. About 13 years ago, he came back. And he says, atheists are like people who have no ear for music. Atheists are like people who've never been in love. Because things like music, things like love, they don't make sense without God. Here's what he wrote. He says, so many things, things like love and music, suggest that human beings are more than just collections of meat. They convince me that we are spiritual beings. That the religion of the incarnation, asserting that God made humanity in his own image and continually restores humanity in his image, it's just true as a working blueprint for life, as a template against which to measure experience, it just fits. Guys, without God, he says, you can't explain beauty. We're going to talk about that next week. Without God, you can't explain love. But it all fits when you recognize that you were created in the image of God. Unfortunately, some of you guys have never embraced that kind of love. It's hard for you to love that way, so you're convinced God can't love that way either. You're not convinced that God can love you just the way you are right now with an agape kind of love, a choice kind of love, that He knows exactly who you are and He loves you completely anyway. You can embrace perhaps the other kinds of love, the loves that we share with the animals, eros, Philos, maybe. Storge, maybe. But you have never felt unconditionally loved. Did you know that every other kind of love is basically self-centered? So a God kind of love is hard to accept. The notion that God loves you completely right now, just the way you are, unconditionally. The idea that God wants to do life with you so deeply that he'd send his son into this world to die for you. That's what Jesus told us he was doing. He didn't have to die. He chose it because he thought you were worth it. And he wanted to drag you to heaven. Guys, if you've never embraced that kind of a love, you're hungering for it. God placed that hunger deep inside of you, every single one of us. And when you get it, it changes life, it changes the whole world. And we celebrate that kind of love every single week here at Capital City when we gather around these tables. A God who loves us so deeply, he knows exactly who we are. He sent his son to take our place, die on a cross, so that we can be completely forgiven by our God. It's an amazing thing. We believe that that bread 
represents the body of Christ broken for us, that that cup represents the blood of Christ shed for us. It's a perfect expression of God's love for you. And we get to taste that every single week to remind ourselves how much we are loved by God, how much we are graced by God. If you're a Jesus follower, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to these tables. If he's the Lord of your life, you come celebrate his grace and his love. If you're not a Jesus follower yet, we need to talk. Guys, life makes more sense once you understand that God is at the center of it. You were made to do life with God, for God, God's way. If you're not a Jesus follower yet and you want to talk about it, I'm going to be sitting right down here. Just come on down and let's chat or... In the room back there, there's a prayer room. There's an elder praying for you right now. If you want to slip back there and talk to him, he'd love to chat with you. Let's bow our heads together. Father, for your love, for your grace, (laughs) blows our minds, and we give you thanks. And now, Father, I pray that you will see us trying to love you back, to give you the honor that you deserve. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.